Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm glad to see all of you here. Um, I think this is um, a really uh, incredibly important topic that we're going to talk about today, and we are in very lucky to have some deep expertise um, to discuss this timely and um, critical issue. So I'm Lee Spector. I'm a professor of computer science here at Amherst College. And before we start, I want to tell you for just about one minute about the AI and the Liberal Arts Initiative that's sponsoring this event. And um, the idea of AI and the Liberal Arts is that AI is not something that uh, only computer scientists should be involved in. Um, earlier uh, in this program, I spent a fair bit of time trying to explain people why everybody needed to know about AI and maybe use AI and know what it's being used for and get involved in it regardless of your background. Um, and I, I think you all know that already, so I'm not going to say more than that right now. But the, the premise of, the, of this initiative is to facilitate that for people in all disciplines. Um, and we have, uh, we've been doing that in a variety of ways, including events like this, but also we have a website, which I encourage everybody to go to. It's liberal-arts.ai. Um, and there you will find uh, information about these events. You'll find a discussion forum to talk about these events. So if you have questions beyond what we do today, feel free to ask them there to, to connect with others. Uh, but we also have a curated news feed of AI-related stories pitched to this community. Um, and we also have um, tutorials on AI tools at various levels, requiring various levels of expertise or lack of expertise. Um, one event I want to draw your attention to coming up is on, what is it, April 27th at 7 p.m. in the Powerhouse. Uh, we have a dance and AI performance. Uh, Marielle Petit, who is a particle physicist, who was using machine learning. She's also a dancer, a serious dancer and particle physicist, who was using AI for her physics work when the pandemic hit and turned her AI uh, on her dance practice um, and learned an, an amazing range of things that has fed back into her dance practice. And she is bringing a bunch of collaborators to the powerhouse to do a performance um, that I think is gonna be extremely interesting and she'll talk about the technology behind it as well. All right, so the format of this evening is question and answer. I'm gonna ask um, a few questions initially, and then we're gonna turn it over to uh, audience questions, and I hope that we'll have a real discussion there. Um, my intention is for us to wrap up at around 7.30 to 7.45, um, whereupon you are all very much invited to our reception in the lobby, I guess that's out there, um, where we have all sorts of tasty treats and we can continue our conversation for a bit out there, okay? Um, so, as is true in almost every other field, AI is being applied to military activities, uh, both for routine logistical tasks and frontline war fighting. Looking forward, it is likely that AI will play an ever-increasing role in combat operations. And this, in turn, has raised questions about the legal and moral implications of endowing machines with the capacity to choose targets for attack with limited or no human control. Some countries, including the US, contend that AI-enabled weapons can be made safe and reliable. More than 80 others have called for a new international law prohibiting and regulating such systems. So to address uh, the range of issues raised by these developments, we have this panel with uh, deep and wide-ranging expertise. Michael Clare, who tells me he's organized over 30 events in this room over, was that something like that? No, I think he had an even 50. higher number. 50. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, has long served as a five-college professor of peace and world security studies. He is now pr professor emeritus of peace and world sec security studies at Hampshire College. And he is Senior Visiting Fellow at the Arms Control Associ Association in Washington, D.C., where he studies the impact of emerging military technologies on the future of war and arms control. He's the author of 15 books, including Resource Wars, The Race for What's Left, and most recently, All Hell Breaking Loose, The Pentagon's Perspective on Climate Change. Claire is the defense correspondent of The Nation magazine, um, and has articles in uh, That's enough. 
<laughs> uh, okay, I'm done with Michael. Uh, Bonnie Doherty is a senior researcher in the Arms Division of Human Rights Watch. She's also a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic and director of its Armed Conflict and Civilian Protection Initiative. Doherty has done extensive work in the field of humanitarian disarmament as a lawyer, field researcher, and scholar. She's written wi widely on the problems posed by autonomous weapons, the proposed elements of a new treaty to prohibit and regulate them, and the process for negotiating such a treaty. She's also been involved in the negotiation and implementation of the 2008 Convention on Cluster Munitions, the 2017 Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and the 2022 Political Declaration on the Use of Explosive Weapons in Populated Areas. Scott Elfeld, uh, many of you know, is Assistant Professor of Computer Science here at Amherst. His primary research is focused on adversarial methods. Um, I learned how to pick locks from him. Um, he investigates the security ramifications of using AI and data analysis methods in domains consisting of a diverse set of potentially adversarial agents, and uh, he works to harden systems against manipulation attacks. Okay. Um, now, unfortunately, our fourth planned uh, panelist, Eleonora Mattiacci, is unable to join us this evening. So I'm going to start by asking a couple questions just for our external visitors, uh, Michael and Bonnie. Um, and then um, I'm going to bring Scott into the conversation, and then I want to bring all of you into the conversation. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's jump into it. Um, oh, I should also say we are recording this. Um, so when we're having the conversation, you should know that. Um, um, ho I hope to be able to share it with people who weren't able to make it. Um, so uh, first, a question I'm going to direct to Michael first and, and uh, then to Bonnie. From your perspective, how do you see the development of AI impacting warfare? How do you see AI changing warfare in ways that previous technology didn't? What do you think makes AI different from other technologies in this sphere? And what do you think the primary risks are? So that's really like four questions. But set the stage for what you think the issues are here. Uh. Thank you so much, Lee, for uh, organizing this, and uh, glad to see all of you here. This should be an interesting discussion. Uh, I think uh, you're all aware that there's been a lot of discussion lately about artificial intelligence and its ramifications and the risks it entails. I study uh, how all of this applies to warfare, and as you'll discover, I have a lot of concerns about that. Should I be talking into, is this for? I, I think it's fine. It'll yeah. pick you up okay. So uh, the, the US, mil I'm going to talk primarily about the US military, but not exclusively. Uh, and the US military is very keen to exploit artificial intelligence for as many uses as possible, believing it will give the US and US military an advantage in future wars. And there's a lot of optimism about this. I, 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 just to give you a sample of the way people think, I, I like to cite you know, documents. This is a summary of the 2018 Department of Defense Artificial Intelligence Strategy, subtitled Harnessing AI to Advance Our Security and Prosperity. That gives you an idea of the tone of it. And just uh, the way they speak about this, uh, the Department of Defense Artificial Intelligence Strategy directs the DOD, the Department of Defense, to accelerate the adoption of AI and the creation of a force fit for our time. A strong, technologically advanced department is essential for protecting the security of our nation and preserving access to markets that will improve our standard of living. So this, this is the ideology of the Pentagon with respect to artificial intelligence. Go, and go fast as, as, as in many ways as possible. US officials are also guided by what I would call an arms race mentality. They believe that Russia and China, but especially China, are also seeking to exploit AI for military purposes and that uh, China may be even in, ahead of us in that. Well, uh, that's a matter for discussion. So the US must rush ahead with the weaponization of AI so as not to fall behind its adversaries. 
And that outlook alone might be the most dangerous aspect of militarizing AI, as it is leading to the weaponization of a technology that is still immature and is capable of making serious errors and mistakes, of which I'll talk more. So how is AI being used by the military? It could be used to replace humans in numerous non-combat functions, like managing logistical trains and maintenance operations. It is also being used to govern uh, surveillance drones and resupply vehicles, and that will be increasingly the case. The Navy, for example, has begun procurement of the MQ-25 Stingray, an unmanned, un, uh, unmanned aerial refueling drone that could take off from aircraft carriers and land by itself without a pilot and refuel combat jets while in motion autonomously. Uh, these are just now being uh, put uh, into production and, and, and deployed on aircraft carriers. But AI is also being utilized for a variety of combat roles. And these will increase as the military gains experience and confidence with using AI. Most conspicuous is the use of AI in providing the electronic brains for autonomous weapons systems or armed drones. These systems, also called killer robots by their opponents, combine a mobile platform, a plane, a ship, or a, or a tank, with a kill mechanism of some sort, a gun or, gun or a missile launcher, uh, 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 and a AI-governed electronic nervous system that can sense its location in space and time, can identify and track potential enemy targets, and under cer certain circumstances, shoot to kill them without any human involvement whatsoever. Uh, Bonnie will talk more about these devices uh, when uh, she uh, follows me shortly. The development and deployment of these systems has aroused widespread concern about the ethical and moral implications of machines being endowed <coughs> with the capacity to take human life and possible violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law. So that ha they have uh, uh, triggered a lot of international discussion about which you'll hear more. But there are other military uses of artificial intelligence that are just as concerning. These involve the automation of intelligence and surveillance operations, data assessment, command and control, or C2, and battlefield decision making. Like commercial AI products, such as chat, GPT, these systems will collect vast amounts of historic and current military intelligence about enemy forces and behavior to generate conclusions about enemy intentions and battlefield movements. And from this, determine optimal strike options for US forces, sending target coordinates directly to whatever shooters, planes, artillery, tanks, naval guns, are best positioned to carry out the strike in, in uh, machine speed, leaving battle commanders with little to do but click yes or no on their launch screens. Without getting Going any further, I hope you can perceive how many ways this kill chain, as it's called, can be jeopardized by computer errors, biased or false training data, or AI hallucinations, as they're called, where the computer, the algorithm itself, uh, makes false uh, de decisions, false, derives false information and acts on it. The risks of accidental and unintended outcomes would be catastrophic if that were to happen in a war situation. Let me identify some particular concerns bearing on what's called nuclear stability arising from these dangers. Nuclear stability is the, 
is a way of describing the disinclination of nuclear armed powers to use their atomic weapons against other nuclear armed nations first in a crisis. Nuclear stability is strong when nuclear powers eschew the use of nuclear weapons because they believe that no matter how effective a first strike on an opponent may be, uh, that power will still possess enough invulnerable second strike retaliatory weapons to strike back and cause intolerable catastrophic damage to whoever fires the first strike. These invulnerable second strike weapons, if we're talking about China or Russia, are uh, submarines that carry ballistic missiles and are underwater and supposedly undetectable, or mobile ICBMs that both Russia and China possess and by moving around are supposedly impossible to uh, detect and destroy. And, but nuclear stability is now being threatened by the utilization of artificial intelligence in surveillance operations, data assessment, command and control and decision making. In particular, many analysts in the arms control community fear that IA, AI is making a disarming first strike theoretically more feasible by combining, on one hand, combining swarms of armed or unarmed drones, aerial vehicles, uh, drone submarines, drone surface ships that are equipped with smart sensors that can track enemy submarines and mobile ICBMs in real time, com communicate their positions to shooters, including hypersonic missiles equipped with AI that can maneuver in flight, and engage those second strike weapons. You know, even if the US or another power doesn't intend to develop a first strike capability purposely, simply the deployment of these technologies, which is occurring, will cause the other powers to fear for the safety of their retaliatory weapons. And so uh, is causing them to take counteractions either by putting their weapons on a higher level of, of alert, meaning they, they might be used more rapidly, or simply to, to uh, multiply the number of their weapons, their nuclear weapons. And we see this happening now with China, which apparently is on a program of vastly increasing its nuclear stockpile, probably doubling the number uh, in this decade and increasing the number of its launch systems, possibly also increasing the number of weapons which are on permanent alert. So even uh, if there isn't a, an intention to strike first, uh, it's creating nuclear, the, the, the deployment of these technologies is increasing nuclear instability. Uh, finally, uh, all these developments, combined with the increasing speed of warfare, the use of hypersonic missiles, which cut down the speed, the time of delivery of weapons from 30 minutes with an ICBM to five or 10 minutes uh, are uh, forcing or leading military leaders to entrust ever greater responsibility for assessing risks and selecting responses to machines, to AI empowered computers, bringing us ever closer to a Skynet scenario, a Skynet from the Transformer movies where computers control the nuclear button and determine humanity's fate. And we are moving rapidly in this direction. Uh, the US is developing a system called the Joint All Domain Command and Control System, the JADC2, which is setting the groundwork, laying the foundation uh, for such a capability, JADC2, 
um, which w uh, has a $1.3 billion appropriation in the current defense budget, but is being rapidly expanded, will eventually connect all of America's conventional weapons, all its ships, planes, and ground forces with US nuclear weapons. So you could see how uh, the, this uh, system uh, will increasingly take over decision making over the use of weapons, including nuclear weapons, and sideline side humans uh, increasingly. And this, I think, is something that deserves a lot more attention and concern. So I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, I'd like to turn to Bonnie now and ask the, the same sort of stage setting question, which is, uh, what do you see as, um, how do you see the development of AI impacting warfare? How do you see AI changing warfare in ways that previous technology did not? What do you think makes AI different from other technologies in this sphere? And what do you think the primary risks are? Great. Thanks, Lee. Sure. And um, thanks, all of you, for sneaking inside on such a beautiful day. Um, it's great to have a, a good audience on, on such a beautiful day. Um, so one of the most significant ways AI will impact warfare is in the use of force. So I'm going to focus my remarks on its application to weapon systems. And I'll specifically dis uh, discuss autonomous weapon systems, which I define as systems that rely on sensor processing rather than human inputs to select and engage targets. In other words, to choose targets and fire on them. Um, autonomous weapon systems may involve technology other than AI, but the most high-tech and most concerning form of autonomous weapons would employ AI. Autonomous weapons to systems have been described as the third revolution of warfare after gunpowder and nuclear weapons. And they're problematic because they operate without meaningful human control. That's the term that's often used, at least in diplomatic circles, without meaningful human control over the use of force. Um, in so doing, they raise a host of concerns, and I'll elaborate on four here, the moral, legal, accountability, and security concerns. So first, for many people, delegating life and death decisions to machines crosses a moral, crosses a moral and ethical red line. Uh, allowing machines, which are inanimate objects that cannot understand the value of human life, to determine when to take a human life deprives people of their, of their human dignity. In addition, weapon systems that rely on AI to make targeting decisions based on algorithms. In the process, they reduce human beings to data points, and using such systems increases the dehumanization of warfare. And finally, autonomous weapon systems, autonomous weapon systems are vulnerable to algorithmic bias and thus could discriminate against already marginalized people. Second, Autonomous weapon systems raise several grave legal concerns, and I'll just highlight a few here. Um, for example, there are serious doubts whether they could comply with the proportionality test, which is a foundational rule of international humanitarian law, also known as the laws of war. Uh, the proportionality principle prohibits attacks in which expected civilian harm outweighs anticipated military advantage. It it's a balancing test. It requires assessing specific situations in rapidly changing environments and determining what a reasonable commander would do. And for those of you who go to law school, you'll get very familiar with this reasonable person standard. Um, humans can apply human judgment informed by legal and moral norms and personal experience to make this kind of this, this, this um, assessment. But it'd be difficult to repl replicate human judgment in a machine. And it would be impossible to pre-program a robot to deal with the unexpected expected and infinite number of situations they might, might encounter on this battlefield. It's also likely that autonomous weapon systems would be used outside of our conflict in law enforcement or border control situations. And in these cases, international human rights law would apply. Uh, I, international humanitarian law applies during armed conflict. Human rights law applies at all times, including outside of armed conflict. Um, and in these cases, autonomous weapons systems would face similar challenges in compliance. For example, people have a right to life, which is not an absolute right to life, but it's a right not to be arbitrarily deprived of life. The test requires that use of force be necessary, a last resort, and proportionate. Weapons that operate without meaningful human control would face challenges of complying with all three parts of that test. A machine would find it difficult um, to determine if a human was a true threat because it could not read the subtle cues in a person it was targeting, so therefore it would be hard to determine if it was necessary. 
a human law enforcement officer may be able to avoid force by negotiating with a human who is a perceived threat, um, but it, an autonomous weapon system would be unable to do this, so it'd make it again harder to make threat force a last resort. And finally, for the reasons that discussed already, autonomous weapon systems would lack the judgment to engage in proportionality decisions. The third batch of concerns is that both for international humanitarian law and human rights law, both of them require that individuals be held legally accountable for serious violations. But in both armed conflict and law enforcement situations, there would be an accountability gap for the harm caused by autonomous weapon systems. There are significant obstacles to establishing individual responsibility for operators. It is legally challenging and arguably unfair to hold human operators criminally responsible for the actions of a weapon using AI if they could not predict or control those actions. There are also numerous obstacles to holding weapons manufacturers um, liable under civil law. And fourth and finally, the use of autonomous weapon systems raises security concerns, and Michael touched on these a little bit, but um, the technology is being developed rapidly and there's a risk of an arms race. And there's also the likelihood that the technology be proliferate widely, including to countries and non-state armed groups with little or no regard for international law. And some people have referred to um, these weapons as the Kalashnikovs of tomorrow. And Kalashnikovs is you know, one of the most common um, small arm used around the world. So in conclusion, while AI has the potential to provide many benefits to society, for the reasons I discussed, allowing systems to rely on it for the selection and engagement of targets is seriously problematic. Uh, even if technology could be developed to address some of the issues, you know, for example, legal assessments, it would not address many of the other concerns, such as the loss of human dignity. And so states should take um, some national and international steps to address these issues before the technology addresses advances too far, which I think will segue into Lee's next batch of questions. Yes, and, and I think yeah. Bonnie should go first. On Let's the go. next one? Yes. All right. Well, so I have one more question just for the two of you guys, yeah. and I'll bring Scott in. And this, this, this next question is, uh, what do you see as possible solutions or approaches to mitigating uh, these challenges that AI is raising? Okay. So if you're not tired of listening to me. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> thanks, Michael. So um, those, of a work, those of us who work on this issue um, in civil society have argued that the, the ultimate solution to this issue is an international treaty. Um, an international treaty specifically on autonomous weapon systems, including those with AI. Um, and there's widespread support for such a treaty already. More than 80 countries have endorsed the idea. It's also been endorsed by the UN Secretary General. Uh, numerous civil, or you know, dozens of civil society organizations. The International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, tech workers, scientists, Nobel Peace Prize laureates, faith leaders, et cetera, et cetera. So there's widespread support of this idea. And I'll talk more about the state of play um, in a minute. But first, um, why, and why do we need a new treaty? Um, there's several reasons for, for this. First, the fundamental rules of uh, existing international law were designed to be implemented by humans and not by machines. They were drafted well before artificial intelligence was envisioned. So while states have agreed that international humanitarian law applies to this new technology, there are debates about how it does. A new treaty on the subject would clarify and strengthen existing international humanitarian law by helping to eliminate disputes about interpretation, uh, promote consistency of interpretation and implementation across the board, and facilitating compliance and enforcement. I would also go, go beyond this, uh, the scope of existing international law um, for example, uh, the laws of war, international humanitarian law, focuses on the use of weapons, but this treaty could also develop, address development and production, uh, which is important to prevent the arms race, prevent proliferation. In addition, it could apply to the use of autonomous weapon systems in law enforcement operations, as well as armed conflict. And finally, the treaty would be international and thus avoid different standards in different countries. It would bind states, be legally binding on states that have joined it to clear obligations and past experience with other disarmament treaties show that the stigma a treaty creates can influence states even outside of a treaty and non-state armed groups. So the proposed treaty um, that I mentioned is widely endorsed would include a combination of prohibitions and regulations. So I'll walk through what those are. First, 
there would be two types of prohibitions on autonomous weapon systems. Um, and autonomous weapon systems that pose fundamental moral and legal problems. First, the treaty should, should prohibit autonomous weapon systems that by their nature select and engage targets without meaningful human control um, for all the reasons that I explained a few minutes ago. Uh, this could include, for example, systems that operate with machine le learning and are too complex for humans to understand and control. Second, we also argue that the treaty should prohibit autonomous weapon systems that target people. So regardless of whether they're fully without, without meaningful human control, systems that um, use certain types of data, such as weight, heat, and sound, as proxies to represent people, um, create problems because they undermine human dignity, dehumanize violence, uh, potentially discriminatory, as I talked about a few minutes ago. So those are the two prohibitions that, that, that um, are widely accepted as elements of a proposed treaty. A treaty should also include what's known as positive obligations, requirements, that states should maintain meaningful human control over all weapon, autonomous weapon systems that are not already prohibited. So these may be systems that are not inherently problematic, but that might have the potential to be used without meaningful human control. And th there are many components that could make up this idea of meaningful human control, um, and that's something that has to be worked out in the negotiations. But some of the key elements would be that technology should be understandable, it should be predictable, it should be reliable, um, then th that there should be temporal and geographical limits on the scope of operation of the weapon system. The longer it's allowed to operate away from human control, the more likely it is to cause the problems I talked about in, in a few minutes ago. So, um, and then in terms of the state of play, the movement towards a treaty has been steady but slow. Uh, there are international discussions of autonomous weapons, Western system, excuse me, autonomous weapon systems began about 10 years ago um, when a, what's called a special rapporteur, uh, which is a UN appointed expert, presented the case to the Human Rights Council um, that th they should take up this issue. It then switched forums to what's uh, existing weapons treaty known as the Convention on Conventional Weapons, a great name for a treaty, Convention on Conventional Weapons known as the CCW. Um, and that's where most of the discussions have taken place ever since. So the discussions have provided an opportunity to examine the concerns and generate convergence around the proposed elements I just laid out. But the problem is that the meetings of CCW operate by consensus, which is basically allows any one country to block a proposal. It basically gives them a veto power. So in this case, a small group of, of major military powers have stood in the way of proposals of the majority of states to negotiate a new protocol. As I mentioned, about 80 states are supporting um, having a new uh, treaty. And in this case, there's a proposal of a new protocol, which is an attachment to the existing CCW. Um, on autonomous weapon systems. So Russia has been the lead opponent, um, but it also includes the US, UK, India, and others that have called for weaker um, voluntary best practices instead of a, a legally binding treaty. Uh, civil society and others are now encouraging countries to pursue negotiations outside of the CCW in either an independent forum or in the UN General Assembly, which are process or Negotiations have taken place for past disarmament treaties and successfully, um, and such as the treaty banning landmines and cluster munitions and a recent treaty um, on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, there was a positive development this spring when Costa Rica hosted a meeting outside of the CCW where nearly all Latin American and Caribbean states committed to pursuing a new treaty. And that brought fresh energy because it involved countries that were not party to CCW as well as CCW states parties. So we're hoping to see more progress in the coming year, uh, particularly at the UN General Assembly, which will meet in the fall. And um, you know, movement outside of the CCW into enacting the, um, enacting the policies that most states agree on, but just shifting for them. So, Hand it back to you, Lee. Thank you very much, Bonnie. So Michael, same question to you. What do you see as the promising, or at least possible? Or, or lack thereof. Yeah, <laughs> assess yeah. solutions and challenges, yes. So, so as uh, Bonnie indicated, uh, the US has been allergic to any notion of controlling the, the military use of artificial intelligence through international agreements or treaties. 
especially with regard to autonomous weapons systems. But this does not mean that the Department of Defense is unaware of domestic and international concerns over the weaponization of AI, including for uses other than autonomous weapons, such as those I've described. These concerns have largely arisen within the professional arms, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the professional AI community itself and among scholars and arms control analysts who studied the risks to nuclear stability arising from these applications. In fact, the first major challenge to the military utilization of AI for weapons uh, really came from employees at Google. In 2018, a couple of thousand of Google employees signed a petition uh, calling upon the company to cease its ties or, or to sever a contract with the Department of Defense for work on Project MAVEN, which was an early a application of AI for military use. Uh, MAVEN was designed to uh, use AI to uh, assess footage from uh, video footage taken by drones over countries like Somalia and Afghanistan and Pakistan to identify what wanted terrorists for possible assassination by armed drones like the Reaper. Uh, Google subsequently did drop its contract for Project Maven, but other companies have taken it on. But the petitioners expressed a lot of the concerns that Bonnie just said about using AI to take human life or to lead to that. Uh, and, and I didn't want to be associated with that kind of activity. Others have raised the issue of nuclear uh, escalation that I described. In response, the Department of Defense has tried to uh, alleviate these concerns within the AI community and the military itself and the State Department by adopting a series of ethical principles for the military use of AI uh, for, to govern uh, the development, the procurement, and the fielding of artificial intelligence and autonomous weapons. And uh, these, uh, in some ways, speak to the concerns that were raised by the international community and civil society. The uh, principles were adopted in 2020 um, following suggestions from the Defense Innovation Board. Um, they call for AI to be responsible, equitable, traceable, reliable, and governable, and I'm happy to tell you what, uh, what they mean by that, but they include, for example, as, as, as Bonnie was saying, to they, that, that uh, under governable, that um, AI systems uh, be under human control at, at all times, and that if a, if a machine goes rogue, uh, you know, goes berserk, that uh, it, it be, before it starts slaughtering people, that it would turn itself off or return to base, something that I personally find highly, I'm, I'm highly skeptical that, that this will ever be possible, but, that's, but this is the code. And this was adopted in January into a Department of Defense directive, Directive 3000.09, and you can find these directives, these documents online if you so wish. Uh, that calls for the ethical use of uh, and responsible use of artificial intelligence. The State Department took these materials in February uh, to a meeting in The Hague of a number of nations and, and released a political declaration on responsible military use of artificial intelligence and autonomy. And this is the official view of the U.S. government. Now, it's sort of the polar opposite of what the people who are pursuing an international treaty call, calls for that would 
that would limit, severely limit, the military deployment of autonomous weapons. What the U.S. is calling for is to allow and, in fact, uh, you know, encourage the deployment of these weapons as rapidly as possible, so long as you abide by these ethical principles. Um, and it's, it's there, the ethical principles are, are uh, truly admirable, no question about that. They are good intentions. But there is no obligation whatsoever uh, to, to, to abide by these regulations, either in the US or in its international declaration. What is instead, it's a little bit like the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not uh, let uh, uh, autonomous weapons go off and go berserk on their own. Uh, thou shall not let autonomous weapons control the nuclear button. Uh, thou shall not uh, deploy autonomous weapons that can't be audited. Um, and so you should all be good autonomous weapons deployers and use them in a responsible fashion. But the intent of US policy, this is very clear, is to accelerate the deployment of autonomous weapons. Uh, this is Kathleen Hicks, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, in releasing what the U.S. what it's called the U.S. Department of Defense Responsible Artificial Intelligence Strategy and Implementation Pathway. Notice it's a pathway. It's not uh, regulations, laws, rules, or anything of that nature. This is aspirational, and. Uh, 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 what they say is, the responsible AI strategy pathway illuminates our path forward by defining uh, and communicating our framework for harnessing AI. It helps eliminate uncertainty and hesitancy and enable us to move faster in, uh, in deploying these systems so that the, the U.S. seeks to accelerate uh, the deployment of all these technologies, but to do so with a veneer of responsibility and ethicality to try to reduce some of the concerns that have arisen, uh, but not to do so in a way that would bind the U.S. in any way, shape, form, or manner. Uh, so I respect uh, the, uh, uh, the the the. Um, aspirational nature of these ethical principles. The ethical principles are good ones, um, that we could stand with them, but they have to be made binding in some form or written into law or, or into bi binding regulations. And I'll, I'll finish by saying I've been uh, thinking a lot about the letter. Some of you may have read this, uh, released by the Future of Life Institute last week signed by an open letter signed by 2,000, now I think it's up to 10,000 uh, scientists and practitioners in artificial intelligence, uh, including Elon Musk, saying that, uh, w that the industry should impose a six-month pause on the release of advanced technologies like uh, chat GPT or GPT-4 in order for the industry to develop its own uh, measures to, to um, impose safeguards on the use of these technologies in the public because of their fears of how dangerous they could be um, if not brought under control. And I think that's what we need to do with the military is put a pause on the deployment of these systems until there are uh, binding or regulations or some way to enforce the otherwise admirable code of conduct they've developed. Thank Stop you. There. Thank you very much, Michael. All right. We do want to have audience questions soon, so I want to progress to that. But uh, Scott here has not had a chance to r respond to anything. <laughs> I'm going to ask Scott for his general reflections on uh, what Michael and Bonnie have uh, presented. Um, and perhaps to include in that a little bit about what Amherst College students 
and uh, the rest of us in this who aren't at the international negotiations, for example, um, can and should be doing. Um, and and a after Scott contributes his observations, thoughts, I'd ask uh, Bonnie and Michael to very briefly say anything that you have to say about what students can do. And then I want to have, uh, again, I'd like to wrap by quarter of, so I'd like to progress relatively quickly to some audience questions. Uh, yeah, so with the interest of getting to audience questions, most tricky tick, I'll try to be fast here. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight that was touched on but I feel deserves more attention is the additional risk of AI separate from uh, computer mistakes and AI hallucinations, and that is active attackers manipulating those AI systems in ways that we can't predict. And I think this could be um, especially damaging in aspects of cyber warfare, where in an extreme world you could imagine <laughs> We have these attackers coming against our cyber infrastructure with AI so sophisticated that our current <coughs> methods of defending it no longer work, and we then have to implement AI to defend these systems. And we are now sitting over here in our happy little you know, country with working infrastructure and a power grid that isn't killing us as these two AI systems war with each other at the border of our, our cyber border. Uh, and Part of that that I'd really like to highlight is while ChatGPT and these other AIs that we're seeing are very impressive, and it seems like every week another incredibly impressive thing comes out, what I find scariest is not the state of the current technology, it's the rate at which it's getting better. If you go look back at ChatGPT3 or stuff from two, three years ago, the previous versions of Dolly, uh, it is shocking how fast this is moving. And I think where we are currently prone to say like, oh, well, at least humans can always do this and they will be necessary to you know, analyze these or make these moral decisions or whatnot, we don't know what the AIs are going to be able to do two years from now, five years from now. Um, <clears throat> and then as far as what students can do, so you should stay in college, don't do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I want to impress upon you the idea that AI is going to infect every sector. And no matter what you're interested in, if you, um, anything at all you're interested in, AI will have an effect on that. And you understanding AI, both at the technical level and at the more societal levels, is going to be important and helpful in you navigating and shaping the world how you want it to be shaped. So it's just a couple examples of this. Um, uses of AI that we haven't touched on here but would still apply to war are, for example, um, war gaming, when you know you say, all right, let's go into this room and decide if we move our submarines here, what would the enemy do and stuff. If you can have an AI that behaves like an enemy general, that'll help you run many more simulations. You could also see this for if you're a uh, running for political office. You get a hand-tuned version of the latest GPT that becomes your political sparring partner to prepare you for debates. Uh, AI will be used to improve uh, efficiency in the power grid. It'll be used to fundamentally change education. It'll be used in every aspect of every industry, and so you should take AI. <laughs> <laughs> take. Uh... <laughs> take Scott's AI course um, in the fall. Um, but before I ask you guys about uh, briefly uh, your advice for student engagement with this, um, I, I just want to underline something Scott said here, which is a distinction between AI technology and all prior technologies. I'm an AI researcher as well, and I hear a lot of the approaches being extensions of the strategies that applied to previous uh, warfare technology, and I'm not sure that there isn't a huge discontinuity. And, and one thing I would highlight is, is not just the velocity of the increasing capabilities, um, but also the capacity for self-improvement. Um, uh, you know, you build a conventional weapon or a nuclear weapon, it does the thing you built it to do, it doesn't acquire new abilities on its own. Um, it doesn't uh, have some sort of co-evolutionary process where it outstrips anything you imagined it could do. Um, and I think that changes things dramatically, and I don't know how to think about that. All right, uh, with that, you can reply to that or not, but I actually 
maybe not uh, for, for right now. Uh, but if I could ask uh, the two of you uh, what you think um, Amherst College students might think in terms of, of doing to engage with this. Why don't you go first? Buddy? Sure. Okay. Um, so just a couple quick things because I know we're sh short on time. Um, first, I would say uh, the can so I'd say the campaign, and by the campaign, I'm referring to civil society. Um, Stop Killer Robots campaign is a is a network of civil society organizations around the world. So that's what I'm referring to in the campaign. It is people from a wide range of fields: um, tech workers, lawyers, scientists, computer programmers, faith leaders, human rights advocates, diplomat. Well, diplomats are separate, but they're also involved in the issue, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever, after you take Scott's AI class, whatever career you pursue, you can work on this issue. Um, so you know you'll be educated from Scott's AI class, but. Even if you don't go into AI as a career, or if you do, you can work on this issue. There's a whole range of ways to come at this issue. So that's the first thing. Second thing is youth have been particularly involved in this campaign. I've worked on a lot of disarmament issues, and youth are always involved, but particularly with this issue. And bring fresh eyes and understanding. And you know, anytime you get a tech issue, they have a, a better understanding of the tech than the old folks, and um, have a, you know understanding of these de digital, what we call digital dehumanization issues. And um, there's a lot of ways you can contribute at, the, at this stage, whether it's raising awareness on campus or at the state or national level, um, writing letters and op-eds, all that kind of stuff, lobbying local officials, uh, national officials. And also, and finally, encouraging you to reach out, if you are interested, reaching out to the Stop Killer Robots campaign. Um, there's a, it has a youth network um, for people under 30. Um, it's the website stopkillrobots.org. If you go to the bottom, um, somewhere at the bottom of the website, there is a youth and killer robots or something like that, youth and killer robots link that tells you about the network. There's also a join us page that tells you how you can organize workshops and get involved in other ways. We do have, um, they do have youth programs that allow campaign uh, students and others to come to like our global campaigners. I mean, we had students in Costa Rica who um, we're helping out the campaign in various ways. Sometimes students go to global meetings, et cetera. So there's lots of different ways to get engaged, and those are a few of them. Very quickly, uh, so I, I was a five college professor for 35 years. I taught classes at Amherst College. I taught in this building on many occasions. I have fond memories of that. Uh, but for the past six years since I retired, I've worked uh, as a volunteer in Washington for an arms control organization, and especially in the past year, come to see how AI has become increasingly a major topic of conversation in Congress, in the State Department, in the non-governmental sector in Washington, uh, in the executive branch, and, uh, and this is about policy, not technology, but about the policy, the law, the issues that Bonnie raised. And I, I could see that policy making around artificial intelligence is gonna be just as important as the technology parts, purely computer science and technology parts. There's gonna be a mammoth need in the years ahead for people who know the science, but who could also talk about the impacts on society and what kind of policies uh, that we need to develop to, uh, to, uh, to rein this in or to regulate this technology to the benefit of society. So uh, there, there will be huge need for people who can combine the science skills with the legal and policy making skills. Excellent. That's a good pitch for why people at a liberal arts college who can also be well versed in the technology may yep. be really important in this moving forward. All right, we do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, we have a microphone right there, and I would ask that anybody who has a, a question or a comment uh, head on down to that microphone. Um, and if there's a lot of people, you oh, can yes. form a little line there. Um, and please do talk into the microphone uh, in part so that it's captured on the recording, uh, but also to make sure everybody can hear. Everybody's too polite. But. 
Yeah, it is, it is on, but you could tilt it up a little bit. Sure, uh, thank you for a very interesting panel. Uh, I'm just kind of curious about your take on how AI will impact the discussion surrounding the current conversation about hybrid warfare, which is a very contentious term to say the least, compelling arguments for and against it as a policy concept, a academic concept, but the, uh, but somebody mentioned the, the fact that AI could be the, the kind of third revolution in warfare. Will that kind of fundamentally change the way that we view warfare and war as a strategic concept where we have to go back and we think thinkers like Clausewitz, the, the people who kind of set the foundation for how we understand it. Well, basically, do we have to start over with our understanding of how war works? Uh, uh, I'll start. Bonnie probably has some ideas. So there's a very interesting document. It's the final report of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And in the opening, it's 800 pages long, but the first uh, page, the, the, the uh, first 30, 40 pages addresses this question. And it, it says that in the f more and more in the future, the balance of power in war will shift to information dominance uh, and away from traditional measures of force so that and it says that and this is almost in a direct quote in the future wars will be will be fought algorithm versus algorithm and 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 uh, on this basis it uh, it argues the commission that the US military has to be AI ready by 2025 and it has 800 pages of recommendations about how to make the U.S. military AI ready by 2025, a lot of which will, will not come to pass, but that's another discussion. Uh, but it, what it does say is that uh, uh, to, to succeed in future warfare, it, 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 will be, uh, it won't be how many tanks and planes you possess, but how quickly you can um, uh, you can collect information on the enemy, disseminate it to, you own, to your own forces, and exploit that information against the enemy. Um, and, and the U.S. military is being designed, and presume, and the Chinese certainly, uh, to, 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 to do that, to, uh, to, to accelerate the pace of battle and to emphasize inf uh, the information the Chinese use the word the informationization of warfare and the intelligentization of warfare. Michael, uh, that's a start. But, but we could spend another hour on this. But th that's a public document, right? And we could link that in our yes, discussion. Yes. So final I, report I will, of we'll the that. National Security Commission on Artificial yeah. Intelligence. Uh, other comments on that question, Bonnie? Uh, I'll add something quick, which is. Um, I totally agree that it's going to, um, there'll be a lot of changes, so there are potential for a lot of changes to warfare. But I'm also going to flip the question, flip the answer a little bit just to be provocative. And um, that in some ways it's also, you, because you mentioned the point about it being the third revolution of warfare, bu building on what I said about after gunpowder and nuclear weapons. And there's also similarities in some ways that there's lessons that to be learned. And one of the readings I assign in my class on disarmament is a reading um, that was about the history of nuclear weapons and it from it covers the period during World War II when scientists were debating and, and pol scientists and politicians were debating whether they should develop nukes and they're looking at you know the pros and cons and the 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 moral issues and the legal issues and the military issues etc and you could almost literally take out nuclear weapons and put autonomous weapons in there and it would be the same debate. Mm -hmm. And so while you know, everything, I don't disagree at all with what Michael's saying about if these things come to pass, how things will change. But I think lessons are to be learned about maybe we should do this right this time and avoid the, where we've gotten with nuclear weapons. You know, let's try to preempt those kind of situations, um, this kind of revolution. It's not too late to, to take action at this point. Awesome, thank you for the question. Thank you um, very much. The next question. Actually, Great. did you have an answer? I'm good. No, okay. Okay. Um, 
Hello, thank you uh, all for a really interesting talk. Um, I sort of have two questions that come from uh, an interesting background. So I don't know if you're aware, but uh, you know, autonomous weapon systems was a topic for high school debate a couple of years ago. And uh, actually, uh, some of your work has been very seminal for high school debaters to <laughs> cite. Um, and so um, I imagine I would you know, understand how uh, you know, the three of you would end up on, on uh, this uh, you know, side of the debate. But I think I have two sort of interesting arguments that you would hear a lot on you know, the negative side, arguing against for a ban of lethal autonomous weapons, autonomous weapon systems, that I would be really fascinated to hear um, how you would respond directly. Um, so one was sort of about the <coughs> benefits of autonomous weapon systems in the sense um, of you know increased um, you know with increased AI there's going to be less human involvement which will mean less human error you know AI won't get tired it won't get sleepy and it'll be less likely to discriminate um, and that could in a sense make war much more humane um, although that's definitely up for debate and then two I think um, it's sort of about the e efficacy of an international treaty to ban um, I think. Um, you know, we started to talk about this a little bit about how, like, um, you know, Russia's not um, enthusiastic about, you know, um, the CCW and, and such and such. But I think, like, with that sort of background about how Russia and China feels about a ban on autonomous weapon systems, how that might inform or shape future advocacy um, related to what we should, what should do about autonomous weapon systems. Yeah. Great, great questions. I think Bonnie should start. I'm happy to take those. Um, thanks. Uh, and I think I had heard that that had been a high school debate issue. So I think someone had told me that. But anyways, that's great that it was. Um, and thanks for raising both of those. Uh, the first one, um, in, and again, this could, we could go on for a long time. But the first one, on the yes, there is. it has also talked about the human error and that, that a benefit would be that there are, you know, uh, autonomous weapons would be less tired, less sleepy, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the idea is that there'd be less emotion and less, you know, feeling and stuff like that in, um, in machines. I would say the flip side of that is there's also um, less compassion. Um, and that's sort of the two-way street. And, you know, maybe it's an issue that neither side, you might balance out. Um, you know, if you have, uh, you know, yes, there's less feeling, so you don't act in anger, but on the other side, you don't act in compassion. Um, there's a lot of studies about how, you know, like in World War I, a lot of the soldiers, there were studies on how soldiers often would shoot in the air because they couldn't quite get themselves to shoot at another human being. I don't have the stats with me, but there are studies about this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of horrible stories about horrible things people have done to each other in war. So, but there is that check on, on killing of other people that compassion brings. So, I think that, you know, for, um, you know, that may, that may be a, uh, the emotion and feeling side may be something that you, it balances out, you know. Um, uh, on the efficacy, efficacy of the treaty, um, one thing that's I've learned from working on a lot of different disarmament treaties is that treaties can have a big impact even if not all states, all major military powers are party to them. Um, the uh, mine ban treaty is a good example. Uh, you know, there are going to, there's going to, you're never going to get all states. I mean, with rare exceptions like the Geneva Conventions or something, but you're never going to get all states. And Russia is a good example of that. Um, but even states like the U.S. is not party to the landmine treaty, but is almost complied with it. It says it's a so-called Korea exception. The cluster munition treaty, um, the U.S. is not is not party to, but has complied with it since 2003, despite. Um, you heavily using cluster missions before the treaty existed. Um, so there, there are strong norms set by treaties. So even if certain states um, don't join the treaty, they can still have major effects on states not party. So I think that importance of international norms and setting high ones can have value even if certain states don't join them. So that's the short answer. But great questions. Yeah. I, I, w I want to say something briefly. Um, the way you frame that question is the way I think this often gets framed in debate is, is implying that the autonomous weapons 
that the military is going to deploy is something like a, a, a robotic uh, gun-carrying soldier that's going to go out and shoot at people. That's not what the U.S. military, or for that matter, the other militaries are building and deploying. They're, the, the U.S. is, it's the Navy that's in the lead, and they're building autonomous ships as their, their priority, and submarines. And, uh, and, and the worry is, because, is, that, is that these will be used to fight an intense war with China, particularly in the, in the Pacific, and that they will carry hypersonic missiles to attack China and its ships, um, and that the submarines will be used to track Chinese uh, nuclear-carrying submarines in real time and possibly attack them. Uh, so th th human emotions have nothing to do with it. It's their escalatory implications that we're worrying about. Um, and the Air Force is building what they call a loyal wingman. These, these are drone aircraft to accompany U.S. fighters in attacks uh, over enemy contested territory that are intended to strike high value enemy targets like radar stations and commu uh, command and control facilities. And for somebody like myself who again worries about escalatory scenarios, uh, these could look like a uh, preliminary uh, to, 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 uh, to nuclear warfare or to escalatory behavior so that could get out of control if these uh, swarms, mad, we're talking about swarms of these. That's what the militaries are building, not the kind of systems that would raise the kind of issues that you're describing. Right. Thank you for But that. thank you, those are very good questions. Scott, you have a... Yeah, so I'll speak just to the, um, the first point you made about making war more humane. And I actually find that argument compelling. I think that there is room for AI to improve things from a humane perspective and that um, it can be seen sort of, I don't know if I want to make this argument, but you could make the argument about assassination and that killing a single high value target has humane advantages over destroying an entire city to get to them. And I could see AI being used in ways such that it does lead to that. I think part of the challenge is that we don't know where the technology is going to go, both in terms of the technology improving and the little robot in front of us. We don't know how it's gonna go. And so while I do find it a very compelling argument, I think we need to be very focused on how can we build systems with that target in mind. All right, I think we do, if we're careful, we have time for both of the people who have patiently been standing there to ask their questions, but let's, let's uh Let's see if we can be efficient well, about it. Yes. First, first of all, thank you so much for, for this opportunity to have this chat. Uh, it's been great to hear your opinion on all the developments and what AI entails in the context of war. Um, but uh, I have to be a little contrarian here and play devil's advocate for a second. And just along the same lines of the previous question, ask what about the possible improvements that AI could bring to warfare? And such I'm particularly, as? sir. Uh, I'll just finish this this little statement. Um, I am I'm particularly worried about um, using induction to think about what AI is or can or cannot do. Uh, we often think, I've never seen a machine do this. I've never seen a machine show compassion. I've never seen a machine uh, operate in this sort of human way, and we translate it to machines cannot do this, AI cannot do this, and in the context of how hasty developments in AI have been, um, I'm a little worried that we apply this induction-based thinking to what AI can be or do. Uh, and just to give a more concrete question going on what Scott was just saying and in the context of the previous question, what do we do if there are AI systems that can reduce a bomb, bombing a hospital to a single target drone strike, or say, can detect whether or not a troop is giving up before a scared human would pull a trigger. Uh, so in the context of these quote unquote possible developments, what do we do then? How do we regulate AI 
in AI development and warfare so that we allow for these positive developments while still restricting the negatives. Do you want to answer? I'll go. Uh, I think you, you've really highlighted something that is incredibly important, and that is the, the failure of induction, as you say. Failure In, of induction. induction. Mm -hmm. To say that Reasoning you know, from the past experience to the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, it was mentioned how, oh, a machine cannot be compassionate. I've talked with Bing, as I'm sure many of you have. It is more <laughs> compassionate than a girl I knew in high school, at least. Uh, and I think there is this uh, curse of human arrogance where we see, oh, humans are intelligent. We know because they play chess well. And then mid-90s comes around, oh, no, you don't need to be smart to play chess. But humans are really smart because they play Go well. <laughs> And then we say, oh, humans are really smart because they can create art. Oh, no, that doesn't work anymore. Okay, humans are really smart because they can, you know, write literature. Well, damn. Right, and so I think we will constantly be pushing this um, undefinable thing of what it is to be human. And while we will now say, oh, humans are human because we can be compassionate and computers can't, we'll see what GPT-9 does. Uh, or at this rate, five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Honestly, I think GPT-3 showing more compassion than some people I know. But, uh, <laughs> and so addressing this to say this is an incredibly powerful tool, right? We have, you know, it was said that this is the um, next uh, after gunpowder and nuclear, or it's the, the Kalashnikov of tomorrow, which by the way is the K in AK-47. Uh, or, you know, this has been talked about as the next electricity. And electricity did a lot of horrible things to a lot of people, but it also did a lot of truly fantastic things and improved the world. And I think moving forward, we need to approach AI as, yes, it will do fantastic things. I believe in all sectors, including war. It will likely also do horrible things. And war is one of those situations where false positive and false negative aren't weighted the same. And so we really need to focus on this, how do we avoid the catastrophic horribleness? I want to speak. But, yes, but please. Bonnie, please. Bonnie, go for it. My, uh, so maybe I've not done a, an inadequate job of explaining this. So I'll start again. If you read the the documents that come from the State Department, the Department of Defense, they begin with the following: We are guided by the National Defense Strategy and first the one from 2018 and now the one from 2022. The National Defense Strategy says that we are in a ongoing, never-ending, life or death struggle with China and Russia. And this guides everything else. And uh, artificial intelligence is just part of this uh, mobilization of American society to defeat China, to deter China, uh, but if necessary, to defeat China and Russia in warfare. And so the considerations that you raise are not part of the conversation. They might be interesting conversations to have here at Amherst College, but they're not part of the conversation that is going on among the people who are financing these weapons, determining which ones are being put to use and what they're being used for. They're being designed to defeat China and Russia in all-out warfare. That is why what they're being developed to do. So the issue, they're not, they're not, they're not being designed to uh, to, to show uh, to to uh, discriminate against human you know, humans in the kind of finite discussions, uh, finite situations you describe. They're being used how to destroy Russia and China's military capability at every level of warfare. And, and it, it's that, and so we have to deal with the consequences of that. And uh, it's, from my, it's, it's this life or death struggle part that's, you know, governing all of this, and I wish Really, that, you know, that's the part that we really have to address because if we don't turn that around, we're in really, really deep doo-doo because of the high risk that it's going to lead to a nuclear war. And I, I think you bring a good point there, and I think that would be that would
that would be the reality even if the rhetoric was different, even if the rhetoric was we're trying to push for a more quote unquote humane warfare That's system. Right. Yeah. But I'm, I'm wondering how do we go about say regulating um, AI systems in the face of possible arguments for their continued development? I'm, I'm going to intervene to say that's a great question. We're going to have a little time to <laughs> yeah. discuss afterwards. Yes, but thank you, for everybody, yeah. for yeah. your questions. And, well, yeah. I, actually, I want to let uh, other Scott here very squeeze in a question. Is that all right with uh, you, Bonnie? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, then, and then we can continue many of these questions over the reception. Oh, but Scott, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so to have effective treaties, I mean, you know, we need good, good definitions of you know, the things we're banning, and we need means of actually detecting you know, when a state actor, for example, breaks one of those rules. And with how fast AI is developing, I just wanted to get a sense for what people you know and like the policy and international communities are thinking of like, can we actually come up with definitions that are going to stand the test of time or have committees of people that can actually update them fast enough? And secondly, um, detection uh, of when these rules are being broken, you know, with, as it was mentioned, how a lot of, you know, machine learning systems are black box. It's not clear exactly what they're doing. Systems like ChatGPT have emergent capabilities, you know, they're trained on next word prediction, but can play a pretty decent game of chess. Um, so, yeah. Well, Bonnie's the expert on this. Yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, so a couple quick reactions. Um, so first of all, um, sorry, let me just think through this. The, in terms of the definition, I think it's important to have, well, first of all, definition, we don't, we have a negotiated definition because we're not at the negotiations, and usually the last thing, counterintuitively, the last thing that's negotiated in treaties is often the definition. Um, so, uh, which always seems strange to me, but it often is, you usually get like a working definition and then you get to the negotiation. So they haven't, don't have a definition yet, but that's obviously something that's important. Um, I think it's important to have a future-proof definition and not try to, we've been sort of arguing against having like something that's very, um, you know, like defining existing technology. You don't want to do that cause you, for just the reasons you said. Um, I mean, I, I think personally, I think, and we've talked about this before, that there should also be like a general obligation on top of the tr obligations I talked about that would be something along the lines of, you know, an obligation to ensure meaningful con human control over the use of force. So something that would be future proof because it would not be tied to a specific technology. Um, it would be tied to this idea of the use of force and not to a specific weapon system. So I think that that would be one way to address that kind of situation. Um, and, and I think also, uh, like the, even the definitions I provided, um, we're not like, uh, you know, prohibiting autonomous weapon systems. It's like autonomous weapons that meet certain criteria. And if, so, I mean, the, I think the, the, the most tricky thing is how you do put parameters around meaningful human control or whatever the term, comparable term, it may not be that particular term, but whatever that comparable term is. Some treaties don't even have definitions and there's reasons for that. So it may be left for interpretation. I mean, I think this one will probably, would probably have some sort of parameters. So um, yes, that's an important question. I think it can be dealt with in a way that's future-proofed. Um, and there's a lot of talk about general criteria around which people are converging. Um, but that's an important issue. Verification, the sort of what you're talking about in terms of testing, is, a, is something that needs to be dealt with. There are different ways treaties go about it. Some is a more cooperative compliance. Um, uh, and some is a more rigid, very detailed, cooper you know, um, like the chemical weapons treaty has a very detailed, rigid approach, and the um, mine ban treaty is a much more cooperative approach. I suspect this will be more detailed, um, but that's something people are working on and haven't, we haven't gotten that far because we're not that stage, but there are people are thinking about that. I'm not a scientist, a computer scientist, I'm a lawyer. So we haven't gotten to that stage yet, but yes, it's a fair question. Yeah. Um, and I think they sort of go together a little bit because you don't know until you know what you're trying to verify. It's hard to know what you're trying to, you know, they go together. So I, 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 if I could, I want to wrap us up. Yeah, I know you want to wrap um, it up. Could. So worth more discussion, but. So, so let, let us, I, I think there are unique challenges posed here by software and by black box technology. Yeah. That's different than when you have a radioisotope or, or something. Um, uh, but let us uh, thank our, our panel. And let us continue this conversation. We have a nice reception plan. You can step out there and we can talk to each other in person there while you also get a little bit of refreshments. Right?